Um, these lectures, I'm going to give you four lectures on uh, weak interactions. The outline, well, let me tell you a little what the goals of this uh, lecture series will be. Um, Giovanni asked me to kind of start slow in these lectures. And I thought it might be interesting, instead of going into great theoretical detail, to concentrate in these lectures on how we know what we know. So the main focus of today's lecture will be uh, V minus A theory and um, basically the basic structure of the weak interactions. Tomorrow, the lecture will be about precision electroweak. Um, Wednesday will be a only slightly more theoretical lecture. It's about the Goldstone boson equivalence theorem. And then on Thursday, we'll talk about the properties of the Higgs boson and uh, what's known about the Higgs boson already experimentally. So that's the outline. Um, if you think the level of these lectures is too fast, uh, please come up afterward and let me know. If you think the level of these lectures is too slow, then I'm going to be around all week. So just ask me anything, and I'll see if I can answer it. Um, I would like to just take the first minute to um, expand a little on one of the things Mike Michelangelo talked about. Um, it's a historical note. You should know that this beautiful theory of the charm content of the proton that he described to you first appeared in the PhD thesis of a fellow named Edward Witten. I don't know what happened to him after that, but this contribution was very important for phenomenology. OK, so let's then begin a little um, the sketch of the history of weak interactions. There are some very important dates in the theory of weak interactions. Um, 1931 was really the starting point. Well, of course, there's a date up here, 1896, when Becquerel first discovered radioactivity. And radioactivity was a mystery for a long time. The physics community then was much smaller. Things progressed much more slowly. It took a long time for people to realize that beta decay was very different from alpha decay. In alpha decay, you have some process where a nucleus A will go to B and emit an alpha particle. And B would be some specific nuclear resonance. In beta decay, you would have A plus B going to a beta particle, an electron. But this electron, it took some time for people to realize, couldn't be explained by a series of resonances. It had to be a continuous spectrum. And so in 1931, there was the famous letter of Pauli, which begins, Dear Radioactive Ladies and Gentlemen. How, please raise your hand if you've read that letter. Ah, oh, very good. Those of you who haven't, Google it tonight. It's very amusing. In which Pauli um, postulated that there must be an extra unseen particle here, now the antineutrino. Very soon after that, Fermi formulated the four fermion theory of beta decay. And one could really get started trying to formalize how the weak interactions worked. But again, there wasn't a lot of progress until another very important development in 1956 when Lee and Yang pointed out that the weak interactions were actually a separate interaction from the nuclear strong interactions, and one in which parity conservation, which was known to be a very good symmetry of nuclear physics, had never been tested. And they postulated that the weak interactions, in fact, violated parity. And this was very quickly confirmed experimentally by many groups. Now, theorists take that, took that idea and ran with it. So if parity is violated, parity should be violated maximally. And so um, in just a couple of years, one had a very precise theory of weak interactions um, due to Feynman and Gelman and Marshak and Sudershen. And this is the, what, what I'm going to call the universal V minus A theory. 
And so the first thing I'd like to do, and I'm going to spend about half the lecture on this, is trying to tell you how we know that the universal V minus A theory is true. And then from that, we'll work our way toward the standard model of weak interactions. So by the way, how many of you have read the chapter in Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman, about the Feynman-Gelman theory? OK, fewer hands. So this is also something that you need to check out. Gelman never liked this account because it's mostly Feynman, as are all the stories in that book. And one has to question the historical veracity of some of it, but it, it really is very amusing. And the, the crucial point is uh, when they get a letter from, in, in the, the Feynman, how many of you, by the way, have read the Feynman-Gelman paper? Fewer. Okay, um, yeah, the history of physics is really interesting. And this is a very interesting paper because they had to go against the established experimental data on beta decay in order to postulate this theory. And they just came out bluntly and said the experiments were wrong. And indeed, the experiments were wrong. Um, in this uh, um, account uh, by Feynman that I described, he says they got a letter from Valentine Telegdi at Chicago saying the, fun, the FG theory of beta decay is no FG. And then a couple days later, got a, another letter from Telegdi saying, please excuse me, I left out the recoil correction and your theory works perfectly. So um, it, it's very interesting how in just a few years, one got from just the notion of parity violation to a very complete theory of the, at least the charge changing part of the weak interactions. So what is this universal V minus A theory? Today we would write it like this. So 4GF over the square root of 2. The square root of 2 is a relic of the era before uh, parity violation was introduced. Um, J plus mu, J minus mu where, very importantly, these currents are currents of purely left-handed fermion fields. So J plus mu would be, um, let me use a chiral notation here, nu bar electron, the left-handed pieces only, and U bar sigma mu d, the left-handed pieces only, plus the same thing for higher generations. By the way, in this lecture, all the um, Kibibo Kobayashi Maskawa mixing angles are going to be taken to be zero, and the corrections to that will appear in Zoltan Leggetti's lectures. So you have this very simple form where you're taking explicitly only the left-handed parts of fermion fields. And so this theory is actually maximally parity violating. The parity conjugate of that is the thing with only right-handed fields. It's a totally distinct operator. This structure is extremely important, not only for all the things that we know about the weak interactions, but as the week proceeds, for all the mysteries of weak interactions. And so I think it, there is some importance in understanding why this equation is true. And so the first thing that I'd like to do is to tell you four really striking pieces of experimental data that support this universal V minus A interaction. And so let's go through them one by one. The first one is obviously that, oh, and let me just provide a little more notation. Maybe I should do that over here. So in these lectures, I'm always going to talk about chiral fermions. Um, fermion masses will appear only every once in a while. And so I'm going to use this basis of gamma matrices. It's the same one that appears all over my book. So this sigma bar is what appears down there. Um, the Dirac Lagrangian in this notation, so that's d slash minus m psi, reads 
psi dagger left i sigma dot del psi left plus i psi dagger right. Um, sorry. That, yeah, that's a sigma bar. That's a sigma minus m So the purely left-handed massless states, so if the mass were zero, the purely left-handed parts of the fermion field and the purely right-handed parts of the fermion field would never talk to each other, except as some of you know through anomalies. And the addition of the mass term requires the mixing of left and right, which is eventually going to require that the Higgs boson comes in and intervenes here. So, there are various things about um, this chiral projection which are going to now become important and we'll see how they work in the data. So let me now talk about the evidence for this structure of the weak interactions. Well, the most obvious one is that if the weak interactions communicate only with left-handed electrons, then if you actually measure the polarization of electrons coming out of beta decay, those electrons should be preferentially left-handed. And one can make that a little more precise. So let's remember that um, in the notation that I wrote there, an electron spinner is this. So if the momentum parallel to the three axis is this for a left-handed electron, and it's E minus P and E plus P downstairs for a right-handed electron. Now, if I have a, if I'm coupling to the, what I called over there the left-handed component, that's the upper two components in this matrix. So that means that the polarization of an electron coming out of beta decay, which is the number of E lefts minus the number of E rights divided by the sum of those things, is the square of what you see in those entries. E plus P minus E minus P over the sum, which is P over E. And so there are lots of beta decay nuclei, but what you can see is as you increase the gap between the two levels, so that electrons come out more and more relativistic, they should come out left-handed or left-handed polarized with exactly this degree of polarization. Now here's what the data looks like. Um, this is mid-1970s data. It may have improved since then, but already it's pretty impressive. So on the bottom axis, you have V over C from 0 to 1. On the vertical axis, you have the degree of left-handed polarization from 0 to 100%. And you see it really works spectacularly well. So the number two piece of evidence for V minus A is something that, when I first started studying elementary particle physics, seemed to me a puzzle. But um, somehow the people around me all seem to understand it. But I, I think it is something that's really remarkable. In the universal V minus A theory, there, are, of course, are three kinds of neutrinos. So there's another term here with the muon. And the term with the electron is exactly the same as the term with the muon. But on the other hand, if you know a little about real elementary particles, you know that the branching ratio of a pi on to e nu over the branching ratio of a pi on to mu nu is extremely not equal to 1. In fact, it's 1.23 times 10 to the minus 4. So where did that come from? So that's, again, a consequence of the universal V minus A theory when you actually work out the details of it. Um, the matrix element here is, again, 4GF over the square root of 2. There's a J plus and a J minus. The J plus is the thing that, sorry, the J, 
sorry, how do I want to do this? Let's put positives everywhere. The J minus is the thing that annihilates the pion. And this is a Goldstone boson type matrix element. It's proportional to P mu and F pi. There's a 1 over square root of 2. That's the only thing we're going to need about it. This quantity here is made up of lepton spinners, 0 on one side and nu E plus on the other side. So it's going to be U bar sigma mu V, um, the neutrino here and the positron here. And so what we have to do is to dot P mu into this and evaluate it. The relevant spinners are for the neutrino, the square root of 2 times the energy of the neutrino. Um, let's get the neutrino moving in the positive 3 direction. For the electron, We have here V. The electron is, or the muon, let's say, is massive. So we have the same structure. The square root of E minus P and E plus P. Um, 0, 1, 0, 1. Um, the electron is going backwards. So I've Please excuse me. The electron is going backward. Oh, and there's a minus sign here. The electron is going backwards, so I've rotated the spinner by 180 degrees. And it's a down spinner because this is the V. It's, this is the hole that, this is the particle which when you eject it gives a hole, which is the positron. Now, P mu times sigma mu is equal to 1. So now this is really easy to evaluate. It's just um, u dagger p dot sigma bar v is equal to the dot product of the upper components, which has in it a square root of 2e and a square root of e minus p. So. Let's now go over here and just work out the mass dependence of that thing. The rate for pi plus to e plus nu is the square of the matrix element that I wrote there. So e minus p times the energy of the neutrino. Um, there's, a, of course, the usual. 1 over 2 m pi, 1 over 8 pi for phase space. There's also a, a 2 momentum over m pi for phase space. And this factor is another, p is the same thing as the energy of the neutrino. The process is two-body kinematics into a massless and a massive particle. So that means that the energy of the electron is m pi squared minus m e squared over 2 m pi. And the momentum of the electron is m pi squared, sorry, this is plus, this is minus m e squared over 2 m pi. So e minus p is just the mass of the electron squared. And so this now turns out to be the mass of the electron squared, and then these various factors of p give you factors of m e squared over m pi squared. There's one from here, and there's one from phase space. If I want to know what the relative branching ratios are for electrons and muons, I would just take the ratio here for electrons and muons. And if you just work this out with no higher order corrections, you get 1.28, I believe, times 10 to the minus 4. So, the basic principle, I think, um, one can state more simply. The decay we were talking about has 
a pion which has no spin. It has a neutrino which is always left-handed. So the electron, the positron spin has to go this way. The positron also has to be left-handed. But the left-handed positron is the antiparticle of the right-handed electron, which it doesn't couple in V minus A theory except via the mass. And so this process has a natural mass suppression. When you square it, you get this m squared factor here. If the weak interactions weren't precisely chiral, you'd get something different here and something much larger. But this is apparently the way the world works. Okay. okay. Number three is the theory of mu decay. And actually, mu decay is at one of the places where parity violation appeared very early in experiments. As soon as people had the idea to look for parity violation, um, the, uh, the relevant experimenters, uh, Garwin and Letterman and Telegdi and Friedman, realized that if parity violation were large in weak interactions, then you could just see it as an order one effect in muon decay. And indeed it's there, and the calculation is very, kind of very fun to do. So let's talk about that. Muon decay to an electron, an electron antineutrino, and a muon neutrino. The matrix element is, uh, again, um, 4G Fermi over root 2. U dagger for the E, sigma mu and V for the electron antineutrino, U dagger for the muon neutrino, sigma and a U for the muon itself. Yes? I'm sorry? Yes? Right? Because if it was equal, then we wouldn't have that process. A absolutely. And that's in this formula. It's this factor here. So this number, it could even be smaller if it were not for that. Sorry? Oh, please excuse me. Um, is this too small? Okay, good. Okay, um, there are lots of ways of getting the square of this. Uh, one rather simple and effective way is to use the Fierce identity. Sigma alpha beta, sigma bar mu, gamma delta is two epsilon alpha beta, epsilon gamma delta. So now um, what this, sorry, um, please excuse me, alpha, gamma, and epsilon, beta, delta. That's the relevant Fierce identity. So what that does is to split this expression into two scalar factors, u dagger e alpha, epsilon alpha, gamma, um, together with the other u dagger, and V of the new E bar, beta, epsilon, beta, delta, U, delta, mu. Now, each of these factors is a Lorentz scalar. So you can go to a preferred frame to evaluate it very easily. For example, if you evaluate this in the muon frame, then it is more or less, um, the square root of the mass of the muon, which is the normalization factor for this, um, the uh, square root of two uh, e nu bar, and that's it. And this one, the easiest way to do that is to go to a frame where the electron 
and the muon neutrino are back to back. And in that frame, this thing evaluates to uh, four um, E electron E neutrino. And if you look at these things, what they are, are the square root of two uh, P E dot P nu. And this, the square root of P nu bar dot P mu. And um, now we're done. So the matrix element squared is just 4, the square of this 2, times 2 pe dot p mu times time p nu mu times p nu dot p nu bar. Okay. Now, to get all this straight, you have to do three-body kinematics, which is the other kind of very elementary kind of relativistic kinematics that should be just second-hand to all of you. Um, here are the basic formulae for three-body, totally massless kinematics. You define some quantities xi, which are 2q dot pi over q squared. The three x's, because it's p1 dot p2 dot plus p3 in the final state add up to 2. Um, you notice that p1, so this is, please excuse me, q goes to p1 plus p2 plus p3. p1 plus p2 squared is q minus p3 squared is q squared minus 2q dot p3 plus p3 squared is equal to 1 minus x3. And then here, there would be an m squared if this particle were massive. Right now, I'm going to take it massless. Well, now we're, we're pretty much all set. So we can just write the total, de oh, and one more important formula, three-body phase space is then just a simple integral over these x's x1, x2, q squared over 128 pi cubed. So now we're all set. We can write this as m mu squared over 128 pi cubed. The integral over the energy fraction of the electron, the inter integral over the energy fraction of the antineutrino, and then just pick up the factors from this expression. This one is an x nu. Uh, this one, that dot that, gives us a 1 minus x nu, nu bar. And then if you just do this integral, this is from uh, the phase space region is over a region that looks like this. x electron and x antineutrino. So we're going to do this integral from 0 to 1 and this integral from 1 to 1 minus xe. If you do this integral, what you get is xe squared over 2 minus xe cubed over 3. And so we get now the following structure. d gamma, in terms of the fraction of its maximum value that the electron can have, um, is proportional to this expression here, xe squared times 1 minus 2 thirds xe. If you look at that function, it has a very distinctive shape. It's quadratic for small values, and it actually has zero derivative at the endpoint. So it's, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> just like that. And when you go and measure this, wow, that's exactly what it looks like. 
There's a little rounding you see at the top. That's due to photon emission from the outgoing electron, the radiative correction. But the basic shape of that is given exactly by the function that I presented here. And again, everything depends on all the particles being left-handed projected. It's again a prediction of V minus A theory. Now, there's one more very interesting prediction of V minus A theory that um, I, I think I just have to be a little more sketchy about, but I'm hoping that, oh, sorry, there's one more thing I have to tell you about this which is totally amazing. If you, let's now think about the kinematics that happens at this end where the electron has its maximum value. So in that case, the muon is here. The electron is emitted with its maximum value, so xe equal to 1. The two neutrinos have to recoil against it. The mu nu, according to V minus A theory, is left-handed. The nu e is right-handed. And the electron, if I can ignore the electron mass, and that's a good approximation here, is also left-handed. So this can only conserve angular momentum if the muon spin points this way. And so there's an interesting observation that for at xe equals 1, d gamma d cosine theta is proportional to 1 minus cosine theta. That is, the electron is always emitted in the direction opposite from the muon spin. Now, it's possible to test this rather sensitively. And this was done um, in the 80s in a beautiful experiment at Triumph by a Triumph Berkeley group. You create pions. You stop them. The, pion make, the pions make muons. And you bring the muons over here, and you stop the muons in some magnet. Muons from pion decay, by the argument that we made over there, are all right-handed, essentially 100% right-handed polarized. So the muons coming in here are all right-handed muons. And you know exactly the spin of the muon at the time that it stops. Now, you let the muon decay to an electron, and let's say forward here, maybe off to the side, I'm not sure where they put it, you put some kind of counter that measures the presence of electrons. And now, you put the, you turn on the magnetic field, the muon spin processes. And so as a function of time, you should see an oscillation of the number of electrons that you see here with complete extinction when the muon spin points to the electron detector. Well, they didn't see complete extinction because, of course, there's some depolarization when the muons stop. There are some, there's some depolarization when you transport the muons. But they saw, actually, 98% extinction um, with the simple argument that the muon whose spin points to the electron counter can never emit an electron at the full energy in that direction. So again, V minus A at work um, everywhere that we study high energy weak interactions. Now, there's one more set of formulae that I'd like to write here, which are very important. And so maybe it's worth my just taking the time to, to at least sketch out how this works. And that's deep and elastic neutrino scattering. Now, I guess Michelangelo, he's interested in much more high energy versions of uh, applications of QCD. But of course, the, the first place that quarks were discovered was in deep and elastic electron proton scattering. And there are some very beautiful formulae for that that were developed in the 1960s. Um, which it's worth recalling. So there are two 
the process that we're interested in is this. A lepton, in this case an electron, comes in. It scatters by a virtual photon. It disrupts the proton. Both the initial and the final electron momentum are measured. And so the momentum Q that goes here is known. The process depends on two crucial variables. One is called Y, which is two, um, sorry, let's call this momentum K and K prime. Two K dot Q over two K dot P. So Y is the fraction of the total incoming energy of the electron, which is transferred to the hadronic system. The other one is called x, and x is, so q squared is space-like. We can write it like this as q squared over 2k dot q. And what, I'm sorry. I shouldn't do this without consulting my notes. That's much better. The proton momentum is P. 2K dot, 2P dot Q over 2P dot K. If I evaluate this in the proton rest frame, it's Q0 over K0, which is exactly the energy transferred from here to here. This formula should be written like that. And this has a very interesting interpretation, uh, first written down by Feynman, where you think about uh, making a parton description, a factorized description, as Michelangelo talked about, of this process. So then here you have a single quark with momentum fraction C. Q comes in. A single quark goes out. The momentum of that quark is, please excuse me, this. This is um, 2xp dot q minus q squared. But the quark is massless, so we can solve for xc. And it's exactly this expression that I wrote here, x. So this is the fraction of the electron's energy which is transferred to the hadronic system. And x is the fraction of the proton's energy that's carried by the quark that was struck. So these are two very useful variables which live between 0 and 1 in this high energy limit that I'm describing. OK, so now in terms of those variables, one can write the cross section by basically just putting together this picture and the quantum electrodynamics cross sections. And it takes a very simple form. d sigma dx dy is the sum over all the quarks and antiquarks that you can hit. They're charge squared. The parton distribution function that Michelangelo talked about. And then there's a quantum electrodynamics cross section. Uh, 2 pi alpha squared s over q to the fourth, and a 1 plus 1 minus y squared. The part of this that I'd like to concentrate on is this factor 1 plus 1 minus y squared. This thing here comes from the scattering of left-handed electrons off of left-handed quarks and right-handed electrons off of right-handed quarks. This factor comes from the scattering of left-handed electrons off of right-handed quarks and right-handed electrons off of left-handed quarks. It's got to have that structure for some simple angular momentum reasons. If I bring in an electron which is left-handed against, in the center of mass, in the parton-parton center of mass frame, a quark which is right-handed, the angular momenta are both pointed that way. If I want to completely transfer the energy of this guy to this guy, I can do that by backward scattering. But for massless particles, which is a very good approximation here, helicity is conserved. 
So that means that this guy is still right-handed, and this guy is still left-handed. Now, the angular momentum is just wrong. And so, for this process, it has to vanish when y is equal to 1, when you have complete energy transfer. Whereas for this process, it's not constrained. It might as well be 1. If you do the explicit calculation, that's what you get. OK. Well, now we can apply this to the weak interactions. And the application of the weak interactions is, is very interesting. Um, we can look at neutrino deep and elastic scattering. Um, a neutrino hits some nucleus. It interacts through the universal V minus A interaction with up and down quarks, let's say, that come out of the proton. It turns into, if it's a neutrino, it turns into a mu minus. And so um, what do the formulae look like? I, I put this slide in here. It's quite interesting. This is a relatively modern neutrino experiment. These neutrino experiments go back to the 1970s and even to the 1960s. The first big deep and elastic scattering, neutrino scattering experiments were done in the early 70s. The ones at Fermilab were quite amazing. Um, you shoot a pion beam into a target, uh, sorry, a proton beam into a target, you make pions. The pions are given something like 100 meters of airspace to decay. Then Fermilab's big, it's on a prairie, you go down there a mile, more than a kilometer, you dig a hole and you put a large amount of iron plates submerged in liquid scintillator into that hole. And you get pictures which more or less look like the top, where nothing comes in, having these are the invisible particles that penetrate a mile of Earth. They all of a sudden create a muon recognized as an extremely penetrating particle that penetrates tens of meters of iron. And then if you magnetize the iron, you can measure the momentum of the muon. And so then people could start to measure these cross sections. So let me write the analogous formulae for these neutrino scattering cross sections. This would be something like this. There are four processes that we can think about with just first generation objects. A neutrino with a down quark can turn into a mu minus and an up quark. A neutrino with an anti-up can turn into a mu minus and an anti-down. A neutrino can never turn into a mu plus. That would violate lepton number. But a new bar could make a mu plus. Or on an anti-down, it could make a mu plus. And if you now put this into the V minus A theory, you get some very simple cross sections. G Fermi times S over pi times X F D. Oh, sorry. This is for neutrino proton scattering. Plus X F D. U bar, and then please notice everything here is left handed. So there's a one, but here this guy has to be right handed, so there's a one minus y squared. And for anti neutrinos, exactly the opposite. The quarks come with one minus y squareds. And the antiquarks come with ones. So that's a rather striking prediction. If you measure this variable y, it's just totally different between neutrinos and antineutrinos. If you ignore the antiquarks, which at you know, low energy, q squared of order 100 at least, um, the quarks are very dominant you should see characteristic distributions which are flat and which are 1 minus y squared. So here's the data as given by the CDHS experiment done at CERN around 1980. And it really works. Um, the top set of uh, 
the top curve is for neutrino scattering, um, not off protons, but off of, uh, I believe, an iron target. It's an isoscalar, an approximately isoscalar target. The bottom curve is the antineutrino scattering. The little deviations from the law of 1 and 1 minus y squared is readily explained by the small amount of antiquarks in the nucleus. So there we go. Um, all, each of these four things is very characteristic of this idea that the weak interactions violate parity maximally. They couple to left-handed particles, but they never couple to right-handed particles, at least the charge-changing part of the weak interaction. Sorry? Ah. So everywhere here, I've been ignoring the mass of the neutrino. Now, if neutrinos are Majorana, then what happens is that there's a mixing between the two states of the neutrino, the left-handed um, neutrino and the right-handed antineutrino plays the role of the mass term that I wrote for the Dirac equation. But a very high energy neutrino is just approximately one or the other. So if the mass of the neutrino is sub EV, but its energy is 100 GeV, you can just ignore that mixing. It's, um, it's left-handed and there's some tiny component of the right-handed the right-handed state mixed in proportional to the mass squared divided by the energy squared. Sorry? Um, well, I, I think it's really semantics. It's what, you, it's what you call it. So what I call a neutrino is what's produced in the decay of a, let's say, 100 GeV pion. OK. And now you might say, if it's got a Majorana mass, I don't know whether that, that's a neutrino or an antineutrino. But that object um, must be right-handed. And it must be actually have the quantum numbers of the neutrino until um, no, I, th I think I'm just going to stop there. That object must be so I have an extremely relativistic pion. It generates an extremely relativistic neutrino. Um, that guy must be left-handed, and it must be a neutrino. Ugh. Please excuse me. I'm not answering your question clearly. So, um, so I guess what I'm saying is you have to think about what the experiment is. So you have a pion that comes in and it emits something, okay, which now you go some kilometers downstream and that thing has an interaction. So if you, so this particle here, um, it's created, the thing that's created is, an, is a, the new left before you added the Majorana mass, the unmixed new left. And it basically just doesn't have time to uh, oscillate to anything but the new left here. Now, if you did this at very low energy, um, you would find that there's some mixture of the neutrino and antineutrino states. But those low energies would be of order the mass of the neutrino. At relativistic energies, um, the mass correction is very small. It's proportional to the square of the neutrino mass. So what you want to call this thing, I don't care. But um, what a relativistic pion produces 
is to a very good approximation a massless left-handed neutrino. Okay? Okay. So um, I think now basically all we have to do is to try and turn this theory into a more fundamental theory. And probably most of you know how that goes. Um, once people had the universal V minus A theory, it's a current-current interaction. It's natural to pull those two currents apart and put a mediating spin one particle here, um, the W particle. This necessarily is a particle which is spin one and it's massive. And so um, in the 1960s, people went around in circles trying to figure out how to make those two ideas consistent. And the answer, as we all know today, is the Higgs mechanism. That is, you have to start with a Young-Mills theory, which contains this object, then spontaneously break its symmetry to give that particle mass. And so maybe it's good just to recall a few formulae of that structure. So the first thing we have to do is to try and write this object broken apart in two. So we need some structure that looks like this. The U dagger, we, we need to introduce something that I'll call Q, which is the U D left doublet, and L, which is the new E left doublet. We need to write J plus as Q dagger sigma mu some kind of SU2 raising matrix, uh, Q, and L dagger sigma mu, again, an SU2 raising matrix L. And from that, we need to have, if we go to Young-Mills theory, we need to have this Young-Mills gauge group include SU2. So as probably you've heard when, you studied, when you've studied this in various places, there are various choices that you can make. Um, the first, we now have to introduce something that's going to break the SU2. So we can introduce a, a Higgs boson, a scalar field in the isospin one representation of SU2. Now that's a very interesting theory called the Georgia Glashow model. It has the property that SU2 is broken to U1 because isospin 1 is like a, a vector in the three-dimensional rotation space. If I have three axes here, this symmetry is broken, this symmetry is broken, but this symmetry is not broken. So this theory then leads to two massive, one massless, Young-Mills boson. It would be actually a great theory of unified weak and electromagnetic interactions. And in fact, Georgia and Glashow proposed it for that purpose. But it doesn't work for various reasons, the most important of which is that this Higgs is not suitable to do the other thing that the Higgs boson is supposed to do, which is to give mass to the quarks and leptons. The next thing you can try to do is to introduce a Higgs in the isospin a half representation. But this completely breaks SU2. So then finally, what the right solution, the solution chosen by uh, Glashow, Salam, and Weinberg, 
is to enlarge the symmetry to SU2 cross U1. Now you have a covariant derivative acting on a fermion field that looks like this, d mu psi, and a set of SU2 gauge bosons, and a set of U1 gauge bosons. And the U1 charge here is called hypercharge. Now I have to assign this not only an isospin, but also a hypercharge. And the choice of hypercharge a half is particularly felicitous because let's now give this an expectation value, which we can always rotate into some form that looks like that. It's a doublet. Let's rotate its expectation value into the bottom component. If I now act on this with a general SU2 and U1 transformation, what appears here is this factor a half. If I choose alpha equals beta, alpha 3 equals beta, this is a phase e to the i minus alpha over 2 plus i beta over 2. And if I choose alpha equals beta, this expectation value is left invariant. So with this choice, with the choice of the gauge group SU2 cross U1, and with this structure of the expectation value, there is one symmetry left unbroken. And so then we're going to get three massive and one massless uh, gauge boson. Well, at this point, you can take this structure um, and work out both the mass matrix and the interactions of quarks and leptons. And maybe I should probably say this is a standard exercise. So let me tell you what the results are. The first thing that you find is the mass matrix of the gauge bosons. And it turns out to have this form. There's a V squared over four that appears here, a g squared, g squared, and g squared from the SU2 part. So if you only had SU2, you would have complete breaking. If you only had this isospin a half Higgs boson and only SU2, not U1, you would have complete breaking of the gauge symmetry and a structure of masses where all three masses were equal. Down here, you have G prime. This matrix has to have a zero eigenvalue, so the only thing you can put in here is G, G prime. And the only things that can mix are the neutral components of the gauge bosons. And so out of that, diagonalizing this, you get um, the W bosons. W plus or minus is A1 minus or plus I A2 over the square root of 2 the Z boson as uh, G A3 minus G prime B, which I didn't write, and the massless gauge boson G prime A3 plus G times B. So um, from this matrix, these get masses. Mw is GV over 2. Mz is G squared plus G prime squared to the 1 half V over 2. And Ma is equal to 0. It's the relation between these two masses is quite interesting. And it's something to keep an eye on as you go into kind of more advanced theories of weak interactions and the Higgs mechanism. Conventionally, we write um, g over the square root of g squared plus g prime squared as the cosine of the weak mixing angle. And 
g prime over that same thing as the sine of the weak mixing angle. In the rest of these lectures, I'm going to call these CW and SW. These relations imply that MW is equal to MZ times the cosine of the weak mixing angle. And as we'll discuss in the next lecture, this relation is really very well satisfied experimentally. It's something that it seems you have to hang on to if you try to generalize whatever Higgs structure you have in the standard model. So it's interesting to look at this matrix and see where it comes from. Basically, I, one way to obtain that matrix is you just compute it in the standard model. You um, do as you usually do with the Higgs mechanism. You write down d mu phi squared. You put in for phi the Higgs vacuum expectation value. You just work everything out. But on the other hand, the matrix has a logic to it, which is, number one, there must be a zero eigenvalue. So that controls these two matrix elements. And the other thing is, there must be a symmetry which relates these three matrix elements in the limit where you turn off u1 and you only have pure SU2. The relation here is an unbroken SU2 symmetry that appears in the limit where you ignore U1. So this relation then follows from an unbroken SU2 symmetry in the limit where um, G prime is equal to zero, where you turn off the U1 interaction. And this symmetry is called custodial symmetry. The simple Higgs that you have in the standard model has custodial symmetry because the potential for the Higgs field is a function of phi squared. So phi squared is phi plus squared plus phi zero squared. But if you were to write phi, let's say, as phi 1 plus i phi 2, phi 0 plus i phi 3, if you were to write phi in terms of four real fields in this way, this would now turn into phi 1 squared plus phi 2 squared plus phi 3 squared plus phi 4 squared, phi 0 squared, which is um, SO4 invariant. So accidentally, as it were, this potential for the Higgs field of the standard model is actually invariant under an SO4 symmetry. SO4 is SU2 cross SU2. One of these is the one that's gauged and spontaneously broken. The other remains exact. It's explicitly broken when you turn on the U1 interaction. Now, custodial symmetry is, a, this isn't the only way you get custodial symmetry. This is what happens in the standard model. But in principle, there can be many more complicated models of the Higgs sector um, the first one was Technicolor, new strong interactions at 1 TeV, which automatically have custodial symmetry and which protect this relation. And I think when you hear Marcus Ludi talk about models of electroweak symmetry breaking beyond the standard model, he'll try to arrange that the models that he has have custodial symmetry by essentially um, strategies that become weirder and weirder as the models become more and more complex. Um, okay, now um, I'd like to talk just a little about the structure of the couplings of the Z. It's a kind of standard exercise in the formulation of the standard model to work out what the couplings of the standard model gauge bosons are to various fermions. Um, let's just call this field F. So this is d mu i g 
a mu a, um, if f is an iso doublet, it's got a sigma here. If not, it has a zero. Here, there's the u1 boson and the hypercharge. Now, what you want to do is to introduce the mass eigenstates. So here, what we're going to get is um, a1 sigma 1 plus a2 sigma 2 over 2 is minus ig w plus sigma plus over the square root of 2 plus w minus sigma minus over the square root of 2. And from that, we're going to get the weak interaction coupling that the weak interaction coupling has here the value of g, whatever the SU2 coupling was, divided by the square root of 2. For the z and photon, it's a little more complicated. So what we have to do is to plug in the mass eigenstates into the A3 and B terms here. Um, and let me do that as follows. So this is uh, A3 times the third component of isospin, or 0. This could be 0, minus I g prime B and the hypercharge. If you write this in terms of the mass eigenstates, you get minus i z times um, g times cw times i3, um, please excuse me, minus g prime sw times y. And then for a, GSW times I3 plus G prime CW times Y. Now, from the definitions over there, you see that these quantities are equal, and they're equal to GG prime over G squared plus G prime squared. So whatever is the overall coefficient of this is a common factor which I'm just going to now call E, the electric charge. So the bottom line of this can now be written in the usual form of the photon coupling to fermions, E A mu times Q, if we identify the electric charge as I3 plus Y. Now we can rearrange the top line. Um, I think what I'd like to do is to note that this is proportional to SW squared. So let's add and subtract something proportional to SW squared. We would get Z times G over CW times CW squared plus SW squared I3 minus SW squared I3 plus Y. And now this breaks down into a, a very simple formula that the Z couples to a prefactor, which is this, which is the same thing as E over CW SW, with the definition down there, times I3 minus SW squared times Q. And this quantity here, I'm going to call the Z charge. And tomorrow, we're going to go in, in great detail in what we know experimentally about the values of these Z charges. These Z charges are predicted in the standard model. The left-handed fermions have I3 equals plus or minus one, plus or minus a half. The right-handed fermions have I3 equals 0, and then whatever the electric charge is. So the standard model has a definite prediction. And tomorrow, we'll talk about how strongly those predictions are tested. Um, the first test came historically in deep and elastic neutrino scattering. And maybe it's worth just writing those formulae, because they're at least historically, quite interesting. So 
You remember that I told you We wrote earlier in the lecture the formula for deep and elastic neutrino and antineutrino scattering. Um, let me write those formulae assuming there are equal numbers of U and D quarks. It makes the situation a little simpler. So there's a quark distribution. There's a GFS over pi. And then the thing is that the quark distribution for neutrinos has a 1, and the anti-quark distribution has a 1 minus y squared. And then this is flipped from here to here when you go to anti-neutrinos. For the z exchange, there's a similar process. A neutrino comes in. It goes out as a neutrino. It hits a quark, and then um, shoves out the quark and disrupts the nucleus. So this is what's called uh, deep and elastic neutral current neutrino scattering. It corresponds to the lower picture in this plot, where something comes in from miles away, initiates an interaction. The interaction is purely hadronic. There's no muons, and then just goes out the other side. So the neutrino formula there is a little more complicated. It's GF squared S over pi, because now there are contributions both from the neutral current interactions with the left-handed neutrinos and the neutral current interactions with the right-handed neutrinos. So what we're going to see is something like this. From the left-handed neutrinos, the Z coupling to the left-handed neutrinos, Sorry, the Z coupling to the left-handed up quark and the Z coupling to the left-handed down quark. Okay. And those come with a 1. And for the anti-quarks, oh, please excuse me. And the um, Z coupling to the right-handed quarks, which has no I3 factor. And those come with a 1 minus Y squared. And for the anti-quarks, now the reverse. Um, these factors here with a 1 minus Y, and these factors here with a 1, but proportional to the anti-quark distributions. Now, these formulae get quite complicated. And so how do you try to make sense of that? Well, this is where um, a, a simple theory can make a lot of progress. And the person here who had the very good idea was Chris Llewellyn Smith. So what he said was, let's concentrate on the following variable, little r, which is the ratio of neutral current to charge current neutrino interactions. Sorry, which is, please excuse me. The ratio of anti-neutrino to neutrino charge current interactions. And for an isoscalar target, this is, according to the formula up there, very simple. Just FQ times 1 minus Y squared plus FQ bar over FQ plus FQ bar times 1 minus Y squared. And then if you want, you could average this over the acceptance of your detector and just measure that number in your experiment. Then this quantity captures most of the complexity of the formulae that I wrote there. So in the limit of isospin symmetry, actually, you can just eliminate R from those formulae and get the following very beautiful relations. That new charge current over neutral current over charge current 
is 1 minus SW squared plus five-ninths SW to the fourth times one plus R. And the similar quantity for antineutrinos is one minus SW squared plus five-ninths SW to the fourth times one plus one over R. And once again, R is a quantity whose value is about 0.25 that you would, could actually go measure in your experiment. So then you get two rather simple relations with R a constant to evaluate against the parameter sine squared theta W. Now, this was back in the dark ages when people didn't know what the value of sine squared theta W was, so you could determine it in this kind of measurement. You just write the parametric curve that corresponds to these two equations for your measured value of R and it looks something like the figure that I drew on this plot, uh, a figure that in the 1970s was popularly known as Weinberg's nose. And um, this is the uh, circa 1980 CERN data. So what you see is that already from the neutrino experiments, we were focusing on values of sine squared theta about 0.23, uh, quite close actually to where it's uh, come out with more accurate data, data that I'll describe tomorrow. So um, this really uh, was something very interesting. It now allows us to fill in the last missing parameter in the weak interaction theory. Um, the basic parameters of the weak interaction theory are g, g prime and the vacuum expectation value. We want to trade these for things that we can observe directly. G Fermi is something we can observe directly. E, and now SW squared as, for the moment, extracted from neutrino experiments on this curve. And as we'll talk in more detail tomorrow, those give you now values for all of the quantities that we've provided, including values for the W mass and the Z mass. In particular, if you put the value 0.23 here, you get MW about 80 GeV and MZ about 90 GeV. And you can actually go look for these things in hadron-hadron collisions. So just to conclude the lecture, um, here is not the first generation of hadron-hadron collisions, but some LHC data. This is the distribution of electron pair masses measured by CMS. You see it just about 90 GeV, there's a beautiful peak. This is what uh, Michelangelo described this morning as the Drell-Yan process producing the Z. And that peak would be the resonance associated with the Z boson. Um, there's some beautiful events associated now measured at LHC with these processes. So this is, for example, an event with an electron, which you see very clearly as a track and some associated electromagnetic energy deposition, recoiling against nothing. Um, this has, when you analyze it a little further, nice properties of W production. And here's another uh, event from Atlas, a very beautiful electron-positron candidate with a mass uh, within errors just on the Z mass um, that we were talking about before. So now, we've got a, a first picture of what the weak interaction theory should look like. I've written for you a lot of formulae, and so in tomorrow's lecture, what I'd like to do is to, to explain how those formulae can be tested kind of at the next level of precision by uh, exquisite analysis of the Z and W um, in a further succession of colliders. So let me stop here, and we'll pick that up next time.